Well, good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of the Veterans Forum. We're coming to you from the Derry Community Television Studio here in Derry, New Hampshire. Today is the 3rd of April, 2013. For those of you who may not be familiar with the program, let me give you a brief run-in. Since the year 2000, the Library of Congress has instituted a program that they're calling the Veterans History Project, wherein there are vast stations such as this and guys such as me, if we can and will make available the opportunity to veterans of any and all the wars, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, you name it, whatever one we have lately, if they can and will share that experience with us in a televised recorded interview. The masters, if you will, and the accompanying paper will be sent down to the Library of Congress and it'll be incorporated in their database so that from here on out, anyone who is interested in any one of the guys and gals who have done the program can dial it in and get a rerun of that show. The best part about it, we feel, is that we are trying to record history as it was made and told by the people who made it. <clears throat> Over the years, we've been told, can't prove it, but it may be a fairly good bet, that some of our ex-enemies, if you will, have been very carefully expunging a lot of the history books so that some of the things that have happened over the past 15, 20, 30, 50 years uh, are no longer in anybody's mind. We don't want that to happen. So with this type of a program and the people you will see talking about it, it'll be here to do. Anybody and everybody's welcome, if they can and will, to come and join us and share their experience. Today is another example of one guy who did his thing. I'll ask Chris to give him his address, name, and so forth, and then we'll start the program and let him tell you what he feels and what he's done. Okay, Chris, you're on and welcome. Thanks, Bob. If you will, your name, spell your last name for the record, dates of service, branch of service, and then we'll take it from there. Sounds good. My name is Chris Bright. Uh, last name is B-R-I-G-H-T. Originally from New Jersey, but now I live here in Derry, New Hampshire. And uh, <coughs> I was active duty U.S. Army from 1994 to 2004 and currently still serve uh, in the reserves. Good for you. Well, what was your highest rank if, as of right now, then not, not a retirement, but your <coughs> active duty rank? Over I, I left active duty as a captain. Captain? Yep. Uh -huh. Two butter bars. It's two silver bars, two actually. Yeah. Okay, you're there. Okay. Thank you. Now, we know that's what you are today, but I'd like to develop a little history, if you feel like this is your life. Let's go back, like, where and when were you born? How was your family life growing up? Uh, things that you may want to serve. Any of your relatives in the service or something like that? Before you even went in the service, as far as school and the... And then let us find out who you are and what sure. you did. Yes. Yeah, so be bashful. Like I said, I grew up in um, grew up in a town called Middlesex, New Jersey, so central New Jersey, about 25, 30 miles outside of New York City. When? Um, I was born in, uh, in 1975, so I lived in New Jersey up until I left for West Point, so 1994. Good for you. Um, you know, relatively small town, blue collar, uh, I think around 15,000 people. My mother was a school teacher. My father owned a small op he was an optician, so he owned a small eyeglass shop. And uh, my father was a veteran of, uh, of Vietnam. My grandfather was a uh, U.S. Navy uh, ve Good man. veteran. Yep. So, so uh, we can we could discuss that and debate that a little bit later. But uh, okay. but uh, we had Army and, and we had Navy. Um, my mother was very patriotic. Uh, was the type of person she would actually cry like when she would watch, you know, the see the stars and stripes forever on the Fourth of July. I mean that type of that type of patriot. So it was always instilled in me, you know, the the, the service and to be proud of, you know, serving your country and Amen. and everything that 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 we had. So and growing up, being very <clears throat> fortunate, had a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, good family, um, you know, good school, and uh, you know, it, it just felt right, you know, to, to to give back to my country. And so I had the opportunity to to go to West Point. My dad brought me up there, and I fell in love with the place, and that kind of started the journey. How did you get appointment? So, it's funny. So in, in high school, I was uh, you know I was always a, a smart student, but didn't really apply it early on in my freshman year. I was you know kind of a goofball. Um, 
chasing, you know, the next girlfriend and all I the cared next about. One? Oh. Yeah, yeah, oh. and then, then uh, oh, oh, schedule. Worried, worried about the next, you know, wrestling match or or, uh, or or baseball game, and and not really too focused on school. So, were you in sports at all? Any sports teams? So I played uh, our football team. I loved football, but our football team in high school was just atrocious. Uh, I don't think they won a game in four years. So a lot of us ended up running cross country and I which is funny because I'm, I'm not I don't like running but there we were running to get ready for wrestling season so I, I did cross country wrestling and then uh, and then baseball in the spring good so that a man yeah yeah it was uh, it was it was fun so um, <clears throat> so yeah at the end of uh, freshman year I think it was summertime we were getting ready to start the fall and my dad said you know we're gonna go up to to West Point we're gonna go to a football game and, there's no way I'm not, you know, I'm in high school now. I'm too cool to hang out with my dad, you know. So, uh, so put a put up a stink, and he said, no, "Nope, you're going." And uh, so we went up there and and saw the parade, and um, you know, j just took in the entire academy, how beautiful it was right there on the Hudson River, and and uh, went to the football game and tailgated afterwards, and. You know, he was an evil genius. You know, was his plan all along was to get me intrigued and to kind of give me some direction. And so, you know, I remember the drive home, I was asking about that. I said, like, tell me about this place, West Point. You know, what, what's yeah. it all about? You know, the cadets were in the uniforms and they, you know, they look super sharp and the helicopters and they parachuted the game ball into the stadium. Oops. And, uh, and so, he's, you, you know, we, at that point I was hooked, you know, and, and the more I learned about West Point, and um, you know, building leaders and the opportunity to go out and serve your country, and uh, you know, and at 21, 22 years old, to be given the the mantle of responsibility to have to go and lead the sons and daughters. I mean, uh, what an honor! And uh, and and so all that stuff just appealed to me, and I, I came back, and I mean, within a couple of days, I was almost laser focused that this is this is this my is calling. It. This is what I want to do. And so Dad said, Well, you know, you're gonna have to. If this is what you want to do, you're going to have to work for it. It's certainly not easy. And so, um, you know, just focused on, on, on the academics and, you know, I wanted to get involved, you know, in, in giving back to the community. So, you know, volunteered in different things and, you know, kind of joined some student organizations and, and, and led those just ultimately to start to develop those basic leadership skills, you know, so uh, and, and also to make a good case to West Point about why they should take a goofball like me. So um, I, I don't like the self. The, the <laughs> goofballs don't get to the one point. Oh, freshman year, I definitely needed to change the trajectory I was on. Okay. And um, and so you know I, I did. I, I needed to get get that focus. And and so having having a goal and something to really work for mm -hmm. was um, it was good for me. You know to you become good step up captain of the of the of the wrestling team and you know and to just just get involved and do all those types of things. Um, it did. It gave me something to work for and apply myself. And uh, and so I think the first time I took the SATs, you know, my score was was somewhat average. Um, my grades were there, but um, but you know, you just have to kind of hit the ball out of the park in grades and SATs and extracurricular activities. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> then there's a physical test you had to take. And so after my first, um, you know, pass at the SAT, and this is a, a credit to my father. You know, he, he didn't, he was drafted into the military. He didn't, you know, he was drafted out of college, so he didn't even get to finish college. But he, he got me up and we woke up every morning at like 5.30. And from 5.30 to 6.30 every day, we'd study for the SAT. Wow, and, uh, he was really dedicated. Helped me. He really helped me. He knew this was something, because at this point, this was something that I wanted. It wasn't, my parents never pushed me. Um, and that's, you know, advice that I would give to somebody that wanted to, you know, pursue the service. Okay, you have to do it for yourself. Yeah. Because I could tell you that the, the, the day that, you know, we got dropped off and went and the door closes behind you and it's just you and the, you know, and the drill sergeants. Amen. Your new if mother. If you're there for anybody else but yourself, <laughs> you're going to say it's not worth it. Um, so my dad recognized that, you know, how badly I wanted this and how you know, focused I was. And, um, and we worked at it and he helped me get my SAT scores up. And, and so ultimately, I, I received my nomination from uh, Congressman Bob Franks at the time, and I also received a nomination from Senator Bill Bradley. So now, how did fortunate. you pursue getting the nominations? So what um, the contest, if you will. Yeah, uh, the way it works is, I think around twenty thousand people every year open up a, an application, like a, a file at West Point, mm -hmm. and the nomination is really the big 
stepping stone because that'll take you from 20,000 people down to around 5,000 people. And so what you'll do is you have to apply to your congressman, you apply to your senator, unlike any other college, and as you probably know, you can't apply, you can't just apply to West Point. The president, your congressman, your senator has to appoint you. So unlike, you know, Harvard or Princeton or Yale or, you know, UNH, whatever, you just apply directly to those schools. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't do that, so you have to go through this process. And so it really starts in the spring of your junior year, getting all this stuff together. So a ton of essays, um, your extracurriculars list, you know, your test scores, your grades, your transcripts, letters of recommendation from teachers, from coaches, from people who knew you. And the packet ends up being pretty thick, and you send that off. And then um, they, they brought us in for interviews. I remember I went to... Um, one interview in New Providence, New Jersey, which was with Bob Franks. And then uh, Senator Bradley had his interviews in Newark, New Jersey. And it was, it was funny. The first one was with, the, it was with Congressman Bob Franks' team. They, they, they don't go. And um, these guys were just really nice. You know, it was easy to talk to them. And I walked out and I said, wow, I think I really did well on this, at, at this interview. I'm thinking probably Amen. got the nod. <clears throat> So the senator's panel was a totally different story. I mean, these people grilled you. And, um, you know, a high school kid in front of all these, you know, very distinguished people serving on the senator's committee and asking some pretty tough questions. Um, and so I walked out there. I remember telling my dad, I said, there's no way I got that one. And um, that was probably late October, early November. And... Early December, I found out from Congressman Franks that, uh, that I was, you know, got his nomination. And that's all you needed was one. So at that, this point, I'm thrilled. And, you know, uh, it was Christmas Eve. We were getting ready to go to church. And Senator Bradley called my house. Wow, what a me, Christmas present. To tell me that uh, I was also one of the ten from the state that he was going to give a nomination to. And... Um, that was a good Christmas present. Oh, yeah. That was a great Christmas present because ultimately I got in on Senator Bradley's ticket. Um, so, so that was that. And, and so then, you know, went through the rest of the school year and it was really important. You know, you had to, you know, even though you were senior, they the quote senioritis. A lot of kids want to take the, the rest you of the year coach. off. You can't. They, they watch no, for that. No basket weaving 101. That's right. That's right. So you, you, had, to, you had to stay with the books and the study. And, um, <clears throat> And so I remember they told me in May, you're not getting in this year. You know, you're, um, you know, I had like a 3.5 GPA, um, which was, you know, somewhat below average in terms of the candidates. And uh, so they said, would you be interested in the prep school? And I said, I will do whatever it takes to, to get in. Now, you don't need, you need me to join the Army. Do you want me to? I'll go to the prep school. So I was awarded a prep school slot that, uh, that first year. So... And, and we graduated high school, I think it was June 22nd. That, um, and this prep school was out, it was the New Mexico Military Institute, but the West Point Association of Graduates was gonna pay for me to go there for a year, Ooh. get my grades up, and, and then kind come into- a junior into scholarship. Somewhere like that, yeah. So even though I had a 3.5, I they wanted you know something like around- Get a, it up there, a, Matt. Yeah, 3.8, so, uh, so they said, you know, go, go do this. I said, absolutely, but I was gonna have to graduate high school early. So we had all that worked out, and um, and that was the plan. So I was gonna, I was gonna go to NIMI, New Mexico Military Institute. Well, it was, it was mid-May, and uh, and I got a call from West Point that you know what you are in this year. Okay. Um, there, there, you know, in, in, there, there was, you know, they went through and they offered probably eighty percent of the class, but. In terms of across the country, after you know spots were allocated, I was still competitive enough um, that I didn't have to go to the prep school. Good. So I made the cut, and uh, so like I said, I graduated high school June 22nd, and I reported for West Point June 27th. So I had uh, basically five days. Wasted all that time. What's that? You wasted all that. Time. Oh, what was I doing in those five days, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, I was so excited, so excited to to go, um, you know, just a, an amazing opportunity. And, uh, um, and like I said, I wanted it badly. And so to finally have this opportunity was all I could think about. So June 27th arrived and um, we only lived about an hour and a half. So we left that morning for what they call our day, uh, reception day. Um, it's the start of Beast Barracks. And we, we drove up there, we left the house probably about six o'clock, got there around 7.30, 8 o'clock. And you had to report in between nine and I think 11 that day. 
and being so excited I got there early. Looking back, you're probably better off not having an extra two hours with the drill sergeants and being one of the first there because you're just a heat magnet. Um, but you went into the, the big gymnasium and an officer came in, you know, welcome to West Point, you know, and, and you know, 20,000 people opened and we accepted 1,100. And, uh, and, and kind of gave a very brief overview. And then he turned it over to the, the head of Beast, this cadet. And the cadet said, all right, take the next 30 to 45 seconds and say your goodbyes. And so you look over and you look to your left and right, my mom's crying, you know. Um, my cousin was there, my girlfriend was there at the time. My dad gave me a, you know, a, a handshake and a hug and yeah. that was it. I mean, you, which was almost good that it was that short, oh, you yeah. know, just, and, and we turned and you walked out the, um, the, the, across the bleachers, you hit that aisle, you went up the doors and you left, everybody left their family. And I should tell you too, we just, they told us, come with one bag. Um, we're gonna give you everything. So you don't need to bring anything. So I had this little bag with you know, some envelopes and stamps and pen and paper to, to write home. Um, walked up and the doors, when we went through those doors, <laughs> it was on. I mean, that's where all the, the, the drill cadets were, the drill sergeants. And gosh, it was just boom, 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 do this, do that. What are you doing? You, you, you know the deal, you know how, how basic training was. And um, it was such a blur. So from like 10 o'clock, you know, you went, you got your shots, you got your hair cut, you got issued your uniforms, you got measured, you started to get these big duffel bags and you carried it around. Um, and we wore, we, we wore these big tags so they can punch you and, you know, make sure that, punch the tickets to make sure you did everything. And we were wearing gray t-shirts. They shaved our heads right away, so we're all bean heads. Um, gray shirts, you're wearing your black, t your black shorts with the tags hanging off your... Your dress shoes from your Class A uniform, the black, you know, military issue shoes, with your black socks pulled up, and you're just marching around. So the, you, like look the <laughs> you look ridiculous. You look ridiculous. And um, and so they they took us to the mess hall. You you you, you eat your chow in, in in super fast time. Can't look around. And um, and then they took us out into the plane and they taught us how to salute. And, and by five o'clock that day. We marched in our first parade. We did a uh, the formal acceptance, the swearing-in ceremony where you pledge allegiance to the Constitution. Real moving ceremony right out there on the plane at West Point overlooking the Hudson River. At night or in the evening? It was yeah. around 5 o'clock. Sun early. going it down. It was a oh. retreat ceremony. Yeah. So, you know, they've, they've come to attention. Highly emotional. It is. It's a, it is emotional. And they, they fired off the cannon. Um, and the flag that was from the battleship Maine, the, the, the main post from that battleship that was sunk that start that, the start of the war, um, you know, that, that was our flagpole. I mean, so just the history there. Oh, yeah. You know, you're sitting right there, and this was the, the oldest active military post in the country, you know, and it was the post that Benedict Arnold sold, you know, to the British when he committed treason, and, you know, George Washington and, and Thomas Jefferson founded this place, and, and there you are. You're part of that. And... Uh, it was just, it was a very, just here I was after three years of focus and hard work and not doing the stuff that typical high school kids do so that I could Be build there. myself and, and get there. It was, it was a, it was a <clears throat> moving, moving experience and the sense of pride that you felt to stand there and be at the position of attention, saluting the flag as it came down, you know, it's something I'll, I'll never forget. And, um, and so that kicked off eight hellacious weeks yeah. of uh, very physical training. We learned how to you know, march and fire weapons and start to work as a team. And the thing they said is, um, that, well, there was two sayings that floated around a lot at West Point. They say at West Point, the history we teach is made by the pe was made by the people we taught. Yeah. And I thought that was a powerful saying. It was kind of like, hey, you've got some big shoes to fill. Amen. You know, buckle down. I mean, you're talking MacArthur and presidents and guys who landed on the moon. Um, you know, in the Civil War, every single battle, whether it was on the north or the south, every battle, at least one of the generals from the north or the south, it was led by a West Point graduate. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so there, there was, there was this sense of like, you're here now and, you know, you, you better do your best to yeah. carry this on. So, so that was one. But the other thing they, they, they always drove into your head was high school hero, West Point Zero. Yeah. You know, you're <laughs> the top of your class at, in high school. You're the captain of this, captain yeah. of that. You're no nobody here now. Ocean. You're nobody here now. Yeah. So you, they really broke you down, um, and they wanted to teach you. You know, in order to be a good leader, you needed to first learn how to be led. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so that's what that was all about. Was 
you know, take responsibility for everything. You know, even if somebody else messed up, you know, you, you don't throw people under the bus and, you know, you're responsible for your actions and you own up to it. And, you know, one of the, the very basic things of, uh, of leadership. So, you know, you, you went through Beast Barracks and then Beast Barracks. You have to explain some of the terms because we have a, an interested group out here. We may sure. have one or more plebes coming along. Too. Yeah, no, absolutely. So Beast Barracks um, is the, the term that they have coined basic training at West Point um, because it's a beast. Oh. <laughs> and uh, and that they've been calling it that for for a hundred or so years. But that's what it is. It's it's basically what uh, what's referred to as you know as everywhere else is basic training. We call it Beast Barracks. Um, so that, that culminated with a field training exercise and we marched back, I don't know, 12, 15 miles back from the, the campsite back to, to West Point. And during Beast Barracks, the, the, the trainees, the new cadets, outnumbered the cadre by f like four or five to one. All the rest of the, you know, um, the cadets were off training around the world. Airborne school, I mean, mountaineering school, they're, you know, doing different academic programs around the world. Um, matter of fact, when, when I was a junior, I, you know, I worked um, over in Beijing, China. I worked in the U.S. Embassy when uh, I studied Chinese and, uh, when I was a sophomore, so I went over there. So just great academic programs. So they're all scattered around. But when you marched back um, from Beast and from your bivouac site, at this point now, all the cadets are back, and now you're outnumbered four to one. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so while basic training was over, there was a, you know, a great deal more eyes on, on watching everything you do, plus the academic program kicks in. And, uh, and that was intense. So the typical life you know, of a cadet, um, starting in the academic year, the freshman would be responsible for a lot of duties. And again, this is just to get you to work together and just a tried and true leadership institution. I mean, they've been doing this since 1802 and they've got it right. And they just stress you out and put you under these constraints. So you just have to learn to work in, in these tough environments. And um, so we would wake up, the alarm clock would usually go off around five o'clock a.m. and um, we would have to deliver the, the, the newspaper to, to every room, the New York Times. You also had to memorize every single day the front page of the New York Times as well as the sports section of the New York Times. And you'd have to have that memorized by, uh, by breakfast formation. You'd also have to memorize the meals for yeah, the day. Yeah, but what time you start at five in the morning and by what, 6.30 breakfast? So breakfast formation could, could change now, but at that time it was right around 7 a.m. Oh. So you'd get up, you'd deliver like laundry if you had to for the upperclassmen, you'd deliver the newspaper. So then you, you had were to a memorize. Gopher at that time, then. What's that? You were a gopher? Or? Y yeah, yeah, you were. Um, and then you'd, uh, you see, you'd, you'd, you'd get your memorization done. You had to memorize the meals for the day. And then we had a thing called the days. So all the big milestones for the upperclassmen, graduation for the seniors, the different dances that they did, the Army Navy football game. And every day you had to know how many days were left to all these different events. And, um, and you all had to work together, right? So, and then by seven o'clock, you'd, you'd form up and um, somebody would come up to you and say, Bright, tell me about the article on the bottom right side of the, of the New York Times this morning. And the, the format was, sir, today in the New York Times, it was reported that blah, 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 blah. And you just have to go in and you didn't have to memorize it word for word, but you needed to be able to talk for 30, 45 yeah. minutes or minutes, seconds about each of these different articles. And, uh, and, and, and then you would go to breakfast, and it was a sit-down meal. So the mess hall is just absolutely beautiful at West Point. You know, very, everything is, you know, the, the granite um, stained glass windows there, and it was just five different wings. And you'd march in, and everybody would stand 10 people to a table, and it was all by rank. So the, the freshmen, the plebes, you know, they're not freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. They're plebes. Uh, it's the name for freshmen. Plebes from the Roman times were the lowest of the low. So we were plebes and we outranked nobody. Um, the <laughs> sophomores were called yearlings or yucks, Y-U-K, and that stood for um, young upperclassmen. I don't know where the K comes from. Somebody had a spelling problem back then, but apparently that's what yuck stood for. Um, juniors were called cows. And because in the, the, you know, the old days of West Point, the first time you could go home when you reported to West Point was as a, as a junior. 
Now you, you, you would get one pass as a freshman, you could go home. But, um, but back in the olden days, you, didn't, you, you reported to West Point, and two and a half years later, you, you got your first chance first to come home. First day off the limit. And huh? so they said, when the cows come home. And oh, so that's how they okay. became cows. And, uh, and then the, the seniors were called firsties because we had, uh, like it was a, a freshman was a fourth class cadet, then a third class cadet, second class cadet, and the first class cadets were the seniors. And so, um, so anyway, so we were plebes. So the plebes would sit at the end and they would have to dish out the food to all the upperclassmen. And they would, uh, you know, like one of the funny things we would do is you'd get a cake and the cake had to be cut into 10 perfect pieces for everybody. So you literally carried around a, a, a template Oh. With, with 36 degree pieces. Okay. So you could put that on there and cut this cake and they're yelling at you. Yeah. And God forbid you didn't cut it evenly because if you cut a bigger piece than a smaller piece, you had to pick which upperclassman was gonna get the small piece of cake. Oh no, and, uh, no, no. Okay. Right, yeah, right. So, so you, and it couldn't be yourself. You couldn't say, I'll take the small piece of cake. You, sir, you need to take the small piece of cake and then obviously you now, chewed out. now you're chewed out by that, that, oh, yeah. that guy or gal. So. Again, just, just stuff to, um, you know, to stress you out. Just, yeah. And that was every meal. So that was breakfast, that was lunch, that was dinner. So you'd finish breakfast, you'd go back to your room, and then you'd have two or three classes in the morning. We'd form back up, um, you'd do lunch. Um, from lunch, we would have usually like an hour of commandant's training, so some military classes. The honor code was, was huge there. So they, a cadet will not lie, cheat, or steal, mm -hmm. nor tolerate those who do. So it's not, obviously it's, you're not gonna lie, but even if I knew one of my buddies was lying, you, you would be responsible for turning them in or you yeah. committed a, a violation. And that, that he took that very seriously, as they should. You know, uh, one of the bedrocks of a, of a leader is someone you can trust. Amen. And, um, <clears throat> and so, so that, those classes, the honor classes, the ethics classes, some of the military classes that we would do um, would happen from 12 to one. One o'clock class, the academic would start back up again, so from one to 4.30. And then from 4.30 until around 6.30 was um, sports or, or drill. At West Point, everybody is required to be an athlete. MacArthur actually instilled that. General Douglas MacArthur, when he was there, he believed, you know, in the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that on other fields on other days will bear the fruits of victory. And he saw a lot of parallels between leadership in sports and on the, you know, the athletic fields in terms of the battlefield. So every cadet had to, had to play a sport, so you couldn't be a bookworm. Matter of fact, um, boxing was a mandatory class um, freshman year, and close quarters combatives was a mandatory class sophomore year. So you couldn't take these people that were just straight, you know, book smart. They had to be physically and mentally tough. And so um, from 4.30 to 6.30, we would do um, sports and or drill. So if you um, did your sport on Monday, on Tuesday then we would go out and we would practice marching for the, for the parades. Wednesday would be sport, Thursday would be parade, and then Friday afternoon, you know, um, would be usually off. Um, that when was, you say off, did you have a real quiet time <coughs> or was it reserved for some other little ditty? It depends. Um, we had things called A weekends and B weekends. So B weekends were, you were mostly off. Um, there weren't as many of those as there were A weekends. So on an A weekend, that usually meant there was a football game on Saturday. Um, and then we had this thing, we had inspection. And so that's the type of inspection where the white, it was the white gloves inspection. Mm -hmm. You know, all your hangers in your, in your room had to be perfectly um, Position positioned and, and spaced out. Collars going the same way. That's right. <laughs> yep. the, uh, the books, height order going down your, um, going down the, the, in your bookcase, every shoe polished and, you know, just, you know, spit shine to the nice. Oh, yeah. And so that's where you would do that, like on that Friday night, get ready for your inspection. Um, but going back to the day, so then we would finish like that around 6.30, and then um, you'd grab dinner. Dinner was mandatory on Thursday nights. That was just a tradition. The rest of the nights, you can just go to the, caf the cafeteria, or what was called the mess hall. Don't call it the cafeteria at that point. Um, grab something to eat, because from 7 to 11.30, uh, was, was study hour. Study hour, yeah. And TAPS was at 11.30, so you had to be back in your room at TAPS. Lights out was at midnight, but here's the kicker. So, seven to 11.30 gives you four and a half hours of work if you sit down and, and work the whole time. We carried four classes per day at the minimum, sometimes five. The dean, which was a one-star general, mandated to all our instructors that you had to give two hours of homework a night. 
So that equates to eight to ten hours of yeah, homework. Yeah, you might not have that many fingers. <laughs> right, and but and we only had four hours a day allocated mm -hmm. to do it. So you could there you just couldn't get everything done. You they programmed in failure. Oh yeah. And what was um, the mortality rate, if you will, a washout? Uh, so uh, one in four people didn't make it through the first year. From from start years. to finish, but you know the higher attrition does happen yeah. um, in basic training. Uh, we had we had one or two people on that first parade I was telling you about. They just kept on marching right off that field. <laughs> you know, they came out of Sally Port, so they saw their mom and dad. It just kept going. This is There's not the gate. For me. <laughs> this is not for me. But uh, but yeah, from from start to finish, it was uh, you know one in four. Mm -hmm. um, so, but uh, but yeah, so so they programmed in failure. And like I said, I was a I was a good student in high school, um, and I went into my first semester with four F's and a D. I had never, never failed a class. I've never, fine. Yeah, I mean, a B plus for me in high school was, you know. Yeah, that was, right. yeah it was like, mo like mostly A's and, you know, a couple B pluses and, um, so yeah, I mean, I really, I, I, I had to, I, I was not on a good trajectory, so I really had to buckle in and study. Um, ended up pulling those grades up, but I did get one F. Now, if you get two F's there, I mean, you're kicked out. So this was, this was serious business. Um, so I failed chemistry my freshman year. And um, so failure, you know, doesn't work. You don't just fail it. So they said, okay, now uh, in the summertime, I was enrolled in mandatory summer school. The, um, you got three weeks off in between your freshman and sophomore year um, for leave. It was the first time that the freshman really got to go in and leave. And I gave mine up to go and be in mandatory chemistry class. So that was a tough time. You know, I was watching all my classmates head off, and there I was, you know, stuck there. Um, you know, but ended up getting a B in chemistry. I'm happy to report at that point. Uh, and then that rolled right into my, my, my sophomore year, my, my yearling year. And we started that off in end of June with some summer training. You go out to a place called Camp Buckner, and you, you, the whole thing is field training. So, um, you know, more like advanced tactics at this point. We, um, we... Uh, Fired a tank, you know. Oh. We uh, you do your airborne school, you do you know in, in, infantry week. Full engineer. jump school or just? So I did full jump school. Yep, did that there. Um, so yeah, I mean you, you just get phenomenal training, phenomenal training. So so that goes in. So you, I mean you're, you're carrying a lot of credits, but in the summertime you're doing real hardcore military stuff. You're going out, you're training with um, you know with the U.S. Army. You're going out there, you're leading platoons for for a month or two. Um, like I said, my junior year. Um, went to China and worked in the U.S. Embassy. Um, went to airborne school one of those summers. You know, went back and led. Um, so I, I became the cadre for the, the new guys coming in. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, again, it was a crawl, walk, run phase. So now you're starting to get a little bit more leadership. So by the time you're a senior, you're kind of running the Corps of Cadets. You know, you're, you guys are all in You know the name positions. of the game. Right, right. And you've earned it. It's not handed to you. That's right, yep. And you're surrounded by phenomenal leaders, both non-commissioned officers, so all your sergeants are just the best of the best. Oh, yeah. um, the officers were all hand-picked. I mean, looking back, how lucky you are just to be surrounded by so many good people that have you know, you know, done amazing things with their lives. And you could watch and just learn by example. Oh, yeah. And um, so I graduated. Um, you know, it was such a tough experience that I, I, I remember finally feeling like I could somewhat relax when I was marching into the football stadium to, to graduate. I was like, you know what? I might actually make it through yeah. this place. <laughs> if I don't um, trip away. Yeah, <laughs> if I don't trip at this point, if I could just keep myself, yeah. my nose clean for another hour, I might actually graduate from this place. Um, and so I graduated, and it was the first time I saw my dad cry. I mean, he was, uh, he was just a very grounded guy but he was so proud and and I'll never forget that I mean how proud I made my parents and um, came out went back into the barracks you changed from your cadet uniform into your army um, greens your class mm -hmm. A's and uh, we went down by the river and they pinned on my lieutenant bars and now I'm a second lieutenant in the US Army and so what a what an amazing experience and so from there I shipped off to Fort Leonard Wood I was a combat engineer and now, did you have any choice as to what you wanted as you far did. as jump school or whatever? Right, yeah, you did. So, it, and again, it was, it was based on class rank. Um, okay. So what they do is the number one guy in the class gets up and says, I'm going infantry. 
and they might have 200 infantry slots. And they'll take a slot off the board. And so uh, I wanted to be an engineer because I love the mission of the engineers. Um, our secondary mission was to be reorganized as infantry so we could still run around with the bayonets in our teeth and do all the hardcore stuff. But we also learned demolitions and we also learned construction. So we did nation building. So all that stuff appealed to me. I could be a hard charging army officer and, and then you know one year and then the next year be building bridges. And, and to me that sounded great. So I, I got my, my, my ch first choice of, um, of engineers and then um, I was going to go to the 82nd Airborne and I was going to be a, an airborne engineer because at this point I had my wings, I was, I was a paratrooper and I was going to go and do that. Um, it's funny though because, and, and it's funny how things work, but after four years of training and, and just how intense it was, Getting to the army was almost a relief at this point. A paid vacation. It was almost like I'm going to take it easy now, I'm, and thank God I was able to, to to recalibrate and 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 was surrounded by some good leaders. But initially, when I when I first got to Fort Leonard Wood, um, one of the pers the ladies in personnel was like, you know, we had the opportunity if we didn't want to, if we wanted to reconsider where we were going. And somebody told me that at Fort Stewart, it was the Army's best kept secret. It's in Savannah, Georgia. It's beautiful. And oh, by the way, the engineers at Fort Stewart are building a golf course. Oh, the golf course, yeah. And I said, <laughs> yeah. build a golf course in Savannah, Georgia? That sounds like a good time, right? Because I've already worked my butt off. But really, I'm just getting started. So th thank goodness they weren't really building a golf course at Fort Stewart. We were in the 3rd Infantry Division, and that was, a, that was a mechanized infantry unit. And when I got there, we went to Egypt, and we went to Bosnia, and we went to Kosovo. We were in Serbia and Macedonia. We were everywhere. And um, while I was in Kosovo, 9-11 happened. Uh, the unit that I was with in Bosnia, they went to, um, let's see, they went to Afghanistan. Then the unit that I was with in Kosovo, we finished, but then I pinned on captain and moved. About a year after I left this unit, they went to, to Iraq. So it was a, it was a phenomenal unit. And, um, and so I really had the opportunity to do some, some just absolutely you know, impactful you, missions. As an example, you've listed four or five different areas. Can you uh, spot one or two things in each of them that were significant to you or challenging or that you had a good feeling about? Sure. So, um, you know, one of the cool things in Egypt was it, it was a it was my first multinational exercise. So we were there with the Brits and the Aussies and the Egyptians and um, and the French. And, and we were all working together on this big, you know, mechanized, you know, exercise. And I was the S2 at the time, so, um, you know, we played the intelligence role. So the S2 is the, the intelligence officer. Well, that's G2 and the others, okay. Exactly, okay. yep. And um, so we did, uh, so we did, <clears throat> you know, I got to work with these guys, and that was cool. I mean, there we were, got to see the pyramids and the Sphinx and, and work with a bunch of high-speed, you know, soldiers from other countries. And so that was, that was a great, great opportunity. Bosnia, when I went there, um, I was what was called the CIMIC, the Civil Military Commission Engineer, and my job was to go out. So Bosnia was, a, was more stable than Kosovo was, and, and the U.S. government has got this figured out as well. You go in, you keep the groups from fighting, and we, we just work with them to help them rebuild their country, and by keeping them apart, and we'd also focus on, on the younger generation, help them build schools, and and it, it takes a while to do this nation building, but it works. And, um, and so what I did in Bosnia was I would work with, I'd go out and meet with the local mayors um, or some of the, the leaders from different towns and help them figure out what type of infrastructure projects would help them get their economy back. So Basically like bridges, roads. Bridges, roadways, yeah. Right, right. And then what we would do is we would work with USAID, the um, non-governmental organization, and they would fund a lot of these things, and then the U.S. Army, the Corps of Engineers, we would oversee these projects. You know, and, and preferably, we would get the Bosnians and we would oversee them and train them so they could learn how to start to rebuild yeah. as well. Um, Question, if I interrupt. Sure. Uh, when you talk about engineering <coughs> now, uh, were you a, a mechanical, civil engineer, or not? A, what, what was your engineering title. So West Point um, makes everybody have, you, you graduate with a Bachelor of Science, so you had to minor in some form of engineering. I was actually a political science major, um, American politics, and uh, but I minored in systems engineering, so nothing hardcore. But the beauty of the Army, you know, is they will train you. So my training at Fort Leonard Wood, now I'm an engineer, 
they taught us the formulas to, to build bridges and, and you know, soil compaction tests and how to, how to blow stuff up and create crating charges. I mean, they teach you all this stuff. So that's why, you know, even now, and we'll j just to divert it for a second, but that's why the military is just such a great, you know, option for, for, for so many Amen. young men and Amen. women. You know, it gives you leadership, it gives you direction, and it will teach you a skill. So there I am at 22 years old, and I'm working with, you know, very senior people from the Clinton administration. Um, I'm working with, you know, leaders, you know, elected officials from, from Bosnia, I'm working with NATO, and I'm rebuilding this country. I mean, you just don't do that as a 22-year-old graduate. Um, and oh, by the way, I, I've got, you know, about 30 other, you know, Americans, uh, men and women, that you're in charge of and that are, that are looking to you for guidance. So, um, so you, you, you talk about a, a leadership laboratory, you know, and the opportunity to make a difference. I mean, that was, that was phenomenal. Um, so then I, I, I got promoted. At this point now, I'm a, I'm a, a seasoned first lieutenant, close to pinning on captain. Um, and I'm second in command of a 250 person company out in Kosovo. And, um, and, and, and my job there, was, I mean, we had the company commander, and I, I, I was the executive officer. I mean, I executed along with the first sergeant. We, we, we got this stuff done. But one of my roles there um, was to work with this group called the TMK. And it was an acronym, it was an Albanian acronym, and it stood for Kosovo Protection Corps. And what this was, was it was a disaster relief organization that when, when NATO came in, that they obviously disarmed the, the Albanians and the Muslims that were fighting against each other. But these guys, you know, that's all they knew was being in some type of military organization. So they created this TMK to, to be a disaster relief. So they would go out for floods or, you know, like reconstruction. Like the CCC way back in my day. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so my job, I'd work with them. I met with them weekly. And these were some hardened killers. I mean, they've been fighting against each other for their whole life. And my job was to sit with them and kind of train them on new skills, you know, um, how to run a training meeting, how to train your troops, you know, leadership stuff. And we just hit it off. I mean, I like these guys. Um, we'd go, we'd drink coffee. I organized a, a, a U.S. versus TMK uh, soccer match that we did. Mm -hmm. So we got to a point that up until then, I don't think any other unit had, had really achieved that type of, you know, camaraderie and, and trust. That's a good word, trust. Yeah, it was, and because and, this comes into play. So three, four months in, the, um, the, it was Multinational Brigade East. It was a one-star that was uh, a one-star general that was commanding this. And they knew about the, the work that I'd been doing and um, said, you know what? There's a town called Pasjani, and it's all Serbian. And the TMK was all Albanian. They wanted it to be joint. But once a couple Albanians joined, no Serbs were going to join. So you've got this, you know, pockets of, of you know, cultures. And really what we're trying to do is get these guys to start to Build work them. together. Yeah. And up until this point, like we were doing in Bosnia, we would fund these projects, we'd give them money, and they'd just go and do it. Well, this general was forward thinking, and he said, I'd like to get the TMK to go to Pasjani, this Serbian town, and build this bridge. Because right through the town, you know, there was a, 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 not a huge river, but it, it still, you couldn't just drive across it. It needed a bridge and the bridge was gone. And it literally split the town in half. And so the, the, the folks in Pasjani went, went to the U.S. and they said, hey, we need money to rebuild this. And they said, you know what, we're gonna, we're gonna resource this, but we're not gonna build it this time. We're gonna, and so I was told, get the TMK to go there and build it. And I was like, wow, you know, this is not gonna be easy. Um, so I talked to um, the colonel that ran the TMK, um, Colonel Zakiri, I'll never forget him. And uh, said, this is what we want to do. And he was, he was nervous, I mean, because he just, he, he knew. Eggshells. Yeah. But again, he trusted me. And I told him, you know, we are going to protect you. You know, we'll make sure nothing happens to your folks, which was a tall order. Oh, yeah. But, um, but, but that's what we were going to do. And, um, that didn't take long. I mean, like I said, he trusted us, and in, in probably within a, that, at the end of that meeting, he was on board. So the real sell was to the town of Pasjani. So drove out there. It was about an hour, hour away. 
Um, we convoyed out there. It was, at this point, it was myself, my interpreter, my driver, my radio guy, and I brought an extra Humvee worth of security. And we went to this school. Um, there must have been 200 people. The room was about this big. And people were packed into this room. It was hot. You know, the windows were open, and they, they were all smoking. I mean, it was, it was huge. It was a blue cloud. Yeah, it was just this thick cloud. And, and I got up there and through an interpreter, I told them what we're going to do is we're going to bring the team. We hear you. We understand you need this bridge. We're going to get it done. But we're going to do it a little bit differently, and we're going to bring the, the TMK to do this. Oh, my God, <laughs> did that cause a riot. Um, and you know, so I leave the doors open. Yeah, you know, buy people out in the halls. But I mean, the verbal assaults. Thank God I didn't understand Serbian. They, I'm sure my interpreter was probably not telling me everything they were really saying. Um, but they were not happy. And but but the thing that came out of this was there were three people that were, were kind of driving this. The rabble rousers. There was a Serbian priest. There was this younger guy who was the local DJ there. And then there was a uh, like a town. Alderman, you know, like, mm -hmm. a, like a local elected official, and these guys were the voice. It, it had definitely evolved into to group men, group think, group mentality. So we thanked everybody. We stayed there for about an hour and a half, but this it was kind of pointless at this point. And um, so we left mm -hmm. and we went back. And but but the mission has to get done. Oh, that wasn't the end of it. So what I did was I, I, I visited each of these three people um, individually, and. Um, met with the Serbian priest first. And as you would expect, that person really wasn't a big advocate of fighting. But um, again, they're, you know, they, they, they're more worried about you know, taking care of their people, and the Albanians did this to us, and blah, blah. So you know, uh, just listen to their concerns, and spend the time with them, and try to develop trust with these people, and, um, and really allay their concerns about you know, who the Albanians are, and, and we're, we're, they want to move forward, we want to move forward. Priest is ultimately on board. The, um, what was it, the Albanian word for ice cream over there is akalora. And we went, the radio DJ and I, we went for akalora. <laughs> oh. and, uh, and, and again, this was a younger guy. And what was interesting was he told me, on a, to be honest with you, I don't have anything against the Serbs. You know, like, my father does, he hates them, they, they, they fought. That's his That his was bag. his fight, yeah. 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 <clears throat> but he wasn't going to... But it wasn't popular to get up and say. No, oh, no. So really, what we talked about was, you know, I get that. You know, I get that, and we're gonna we're gonna bring these in. But I just what I don't need is you to be. I get if you don't want to you know, get out there and, and and support us, but don't fan the flames. Yeah. And I think we came to an understanding on that. And 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 ultimately, this is gonna help you guys out as well. And then there was the the politician. You know. Um, at first, it was it was a lot of rhetoric, um, but ultimately, what we said to this guy, and you know, and I was much younger. I think I'm 26 at the time. This guy's you know in his 60s, and you know, he's been he's been there a while. He's been there a while, and he's looking at like, who are you? And sometimes you do just need to we're, face up. To it. We're doing this, yeah. um, and so you could either be the champion here, and and when all is said and done, and this bridge gets built. You could be the guy that's going to take credit for this, yeah. and the guy that decided to, to bury the hatchet and let's move forward, or you're going to be the, the guy that you know when this bridge gets done, you're not going to, you're not going to. He got it, and so eventually, um, and and I and I also went on the Kosovo equivalent of CNN. Um, we did this information campaign, and I was interviewed there and talked about the importance of this and how we're going to bring these guys together, and it was just softening these people up. We brought the Albanians and the TMK there the first time and almost had a riot on our hands. And, oh. and we had to protect these guys with, you know, with any means, So which that meant deadly force. If they were going to take shots at this, we, we were going to have to. So you didn't want it to get to that. No. So you really had to feel um, just to have your pulse on, on the, mm -hmm. you know. So I remember when we showed up at the bridge site, because well, I kind of jumped ahead a little bit about how we were, we, we segmented those three groups. This happened about a week after we had that school meeting. The Serbs said, you know what, we're going to build this ourselves." And it was kind of a slap in the face of what we were trying to do. So we drove out there, and at this point, you know, with just Commander Zakiri, and, um, you know, a guy spit on me, which is not cool. No. Um, you know, they were there with their shovels, and people were just, 
they were, they were mad. And I remember at one point, there was five or six guys, they all turned their backs to us. They, wouldn't, they weren't going to talk to us, and they weren't going to let us move. And um, at this point, I had an infantry um, platoon attached to me, and they were providing the perimeter security. And someone comes up over the radio, school just got out, we've got a, a mob of about 300 to 400 people riled up and moving to your location over. Yeah. Um, and out. Yeah. And so my radio guy is next to me here. I'm hearing this. So we got a, we got a group coming in. We got to you know, and, and, and these guys are mad at us, the, the st stones, you know, everybody's armed there. Um, and so it just wasn't the right time. Let's, let's disengage. You know, I'm not going to push this. Um, you just sense like, okay, let's, let's regroup cool. here. It's cool down. We get Zakiri back in the uh, in the Humvees. Um, he's protected. Try to try to kind of calm everybody down, and then pull pull my perimeter back in, and, and we back out. And uh, and so that's when we again we started this information campaign. And so uh, eventually, after meeting with all these people, what we worked out was, um, I tell you what, you guys need this bridge. I understand it's a source of pride. You don't want it built by the Albanians. So what I did was I brought in, um, we sourced it, we got on the wood. We brought in the Albanian, the, the, the trained engineers. So instead of having all these guys building it for them, the Serbs built the bridge. But the Albanians, we took four or five of their civil engineers and we embedded them and they helped with the blueprints and the drawings and they made sure that the, the bridge was built the right way. And it was the first time since the war had started that we had gotten the Albanians and the Serbs to... Uh, Work to together. work together. Yeah. Beautiful. And, uh, and I was awarded this award called the Grizzly Award. I was actually named the top Army officer in the entire active duty Army back in 2000. And I had to, got to have lunch with President Bush when he flew out to, uh, to meet did, with us. Did he pay or did you have to pay? You know what? We ate in the mess hall, so it was free. It was free. Yeah, yeah. but uh, so arguably I paid with my taxes. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so that was, that was a, a, a really neat experience, something I'm proud of to this day. I'm going to cut short for a minute. I'd like to get a little more up to date. Somewhere along the line in the uh, family life, where and when were you married? So I was actually married to, a, uh, to another West Point graduate. Oh. Um, we were classmates, and unfortunately, that didn't work out. Um, you know, we were both Army officers. When we came back from our honeymoon, um, we were well, same, same year at West Point, same branch. We were both engineers, same data rank. And so you can't serve together. Um, you, you can't be in the same unit. So we were both at Fort Stewart, and um, we, we came back from our honeymoon, and then I left for, like, literally that Monday, I left for the field. Um, and I was gone. When I came back, she was on a field exercise. Uh, we were home again for like uh, maybe two or three weeks together. Then I went to Bosnia. Um, you know, then we went to Fort Polk for a, a training mission. We both went to Kosovo for a year. Um, same place? Same pl we were at the same camp, but we're not living together. So okay. obviously huh. she's living in the female barracks. I'm in the male barracks. Um, <clears throat> she worked in the, in the command center. So, I mean, we saw each other maybe for like an hour or so at night we, 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 would, we could catch up and, and have coffee. But I mean, I'm out the, I was out the wire. I mean, we're doing these types of things. We're building bridges and route reconnaissance and you know, working with the TMK. I wasn't inside the wire. Um, and so we just didn't have time to, and this went on for a while. So that we came back from, from Kosovo, we both got promoted to captain at that point, went to Fort Leonard Wood, did our advanced course. So like the more advanced tactics and training. And we said, we, we got stationed there. And so I commanded a company of, of basic training, a basic training unit, and so did she, but again, two very separate units. My training cycle was 18 weeks and hers was eight. So the two days that she would have off, and it was Monday through Sunday, it was, it was every day. I mean, like in basic training, there is no day off. No day off, no. So you got your week off um, at the end of a cycle when you graduated these folks. So we were called OSIT, one station unit training. So we ran all of basic training, and then the engineering skills that came on. She just ran basic training and then would push the privates out and they would go and do their MOS specific skills somewhere else. So again, mine was 18 weeks and I'd get an, a, a, a week off and she, so we're not together at this point either. And the alarm clock went off at 3.45. My first meeting with my drill sergeants was at 0.430. And we put the privates to bed um, at 20.00 at eight o'clock. 
And so I was leaving work around nine o'clock and coming home. So you're near just smoked. So we, after you know three or four years of this, we just didn't have a marriage and um, and, and and kind of you know separated. So 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 that was uh, that was my I'm remarried now, and I and, but uh, I was already off of active duty when I got remarried. Good. So now you're stationed here in the states for a change now, right? Yeah. So um, so I've, I'm a civilian now. I missed it. I had a big break in service and. Um, and I said, you know what, I really miss the Army. And so I went back into the reserves at Fort Devens and, mm -hmm. and did that for, for about a year. Um, planning officer now, it's, it's nowhere near the excitement that it was back when I was active duty and, and, and deploying. But, you know, now I've got a good job and, 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 and kids. And so I'm able to, to serve, you know, when I can. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also the New Hampshire, one of the, one of the New Hampshire uh, li liaison officers for West Point. Good. Um, That's a good deal. Yeah, so I don't know how much longer I'll do the reserves at this point, but uh, but you know I'm, I'm certainly proud to, to still be involved. I was thinking, Chris, with all that you said and done, and the, the politics of today, uh, w would you say that your service experience was positive or negative with respect to how you've been able to develop yourself? Bob, without a doubt. I mean. Silly question, but I know the answer. Yeah, you me, know the you answer. Tell me. But um, but you know, for obviously other people that you know, might even be listening and yeah. wondering if a career in the military is for them, it's uh, everything that I so so I, I when I left the military active duty, I went to grad school at MIT, and um, on the GI Bill or was it? Uh, no, I, I didn't qualify for that at the time because I was a West Point grad, and so they paid for that. To um, I, I wasn't. I wasn't smart enough with my gr my grades to get into. M the reason I got into MIT was because of the leadership experiences that I had in the military, and you know, and and everything built off of that. Oh yeah. I mean, the the, the leader you become, and um, and and now I'm a you know a leader in 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 the civilian world. I run the government division for Phillips Home Healthcare, and, and it doesn't matter if you're leading, you know, somebody from the inner city in Detroit. You know, somebody from from Alabama, and 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 they're they're trigger pullers in Bosnia, or if you're you know it's a finance guy on your team, an accountant. The ability to lead people, and you know, it's transferable, and that's one of the best things you know about the military was you learned um, to take responsibility for your actions. You learned about leadership. Um, it gives you a skill. Yeah. You know, it uh, it really instills hard work and uh, and honor. You know, it's it's one thing to get the job done, but if you, at the end of the day you do it and there's no integrity and you've you've pissed everybody off and you've hurt you people, your time. yeah, what good is that? Yeah. You know, so these the the value system too. I think that I got from the the, the military: loyalty, duty, respect, That's selfless service. That's the magic service. word. A lot of the fellows have said: responsibility and respect for yourself and your people. Right. Okay? Right. And then just a love for my country. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, to have the ability. We, we complain about our, our, our government, and we, that's, that's fair, you know, we, we can do that, but to have the ability to go around and see how it is in other places in the Middle East, and it you know, opens these, them up wide. it opens up about your eyes about just how good we have it, and it also, to, 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 there's a lot of evil out there too. Oh yeah. Um, you know, and so just to have all those experiences have just been, just been second to none. Two words. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, sir. You Appreciate have it. just blown one all out. We haven't even touched the top. <laughs> I thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Folks, it. Folks, that's a wrap. Again, it's one fellow who did his thing and is doing his thing. And we ask all of you, guys and gals who served in any branch, anywhere, if you can and will, come and share that experience with us. Bob Stevens saying thank you. You want to find me? Check the end of the program. I'm home every night of the week, but don't call after midnight if you will. Stay healthy, come and see us.